new vaccine mandates, the Texas abortion law, and the 9-11 anniversary. I'm Adam Bearn, and this is The Square Circle. Hello and welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Bearn. Joining us today are Libertarian and Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute, Doug Bundo. Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm doing well. Nice to be back with everyone. We've also got Progressive Attorney, Georgia Gosley. How are you, Georgia? Hi there. It's good to be back. And rounding off our panel tonight, we have Conservative Newsweek contributing editor, Peter Roth. Hi, Peter. Hi, Adam. Good to be with you again. Well, welcome, everyone. On Thursday, President Biden announced new mandates for federal workers and those at large companies to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Here's some of the president's speech. I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated or show a negative test at least once a week. We'll be requiring vaccinations at all nursing home workers who treat patients on Medicare and Medicaid because I have that federal authority. Tonight, I'm using that same authority to expand that to cover those who work in hospitals, home health care facilities or other medical facilities. So, Doug Bondo, is this a necessary measure? to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, or is it unnecessary government overreach? Well, certainly the federal government has a right to order its own employees to be vaccinated. And the failure of Americans to get vaccinated has contributed to a revival of COVID-19. So there's a good argument to push the vaccination. You know, the requirements for private companies is putting it off on them to essentially finance. And they're going to have to deal with worker dissatisfaction. It's either vaccinate or weekly testing. It'll be very interesting to see how their employees take this. And we may see uh, you know, some revolts in the workplace that could cause problems for companies you know, coming from the political process. So Peter I, Roth, do you, George, oh, Georgia, you're looking like you want to jump in there. Do you make I, I this I was just gonna jump in and say, you know, unfortunately in our country, there's always a protest about everything. This COVID and the vaccination effort that's undergoing in this country, much of it, I think, is unfortunately, I just disagree, even though we have rights in our country, because this COVID and all of these extra strains are coming in, it should be mandated. I think everybody in America should be required. I know some people don't want to, but you're being, I think you're being rather selfish if you don't want to get a vaccine, because not only could you infect uh, others and get sick yourself, but, you know, elderly people, children, I think we have to take it more seriously. Peter Roth, what do you make of that Georgia's point that this is not about, it's more about personal responsibility rather than personal freedoms? Well, there is clearly a life versus liberty conflict, which I'm sure we'll talk about in, in greater detail um, in, in just, a, just a little bit here. But I am concerned that the president is presuming powers that the Constitution does not give him uh, and which the Congress has not given him through legislation to force this on the private sector. He also said in his remarks that if the governors were going to continue to impede his efforts in some states, uh, that he would use his presidential powers to simply get them out of the way. We don't have a unitary government in this country. We have a, a federal system. Governors' powers matter. Governors' authorities matter. Sometimes, and the founders intended it to be this way, Governors are more powerful than presidents. And neither Joe Biden nor anyone else who occupies that office. And we heard this a lot during the last administration from Mr. Biden and his party, that just because your president doesn't mean you can do what you want and order everybody around. Also this week, the Department of Justice announced a lawsuit against the state of Texas regarding its new abortion law. Here's Attorney General Merrick Garland. 
SB 8 bans nearly all abortions in the state after six weeks of pregnancy, before many women even know they are pregnant and months before a pregnancy is viable. It does so even in cases of rape, sexual abuse, or incest. And it further prohibits any effort to aid the doctors who provide pre-viability abortions or the women who seek them. The act is clearly unconstitutional under long-standing Supreme Court precedent. So Peter Roth, the Biden administration, said they were going to fight this law with everything they've got. And it looks like they're rolling out the big guns. What did you make of the announcement? Well, uh, I'm not surprised to see the Justice Department intervening in this case. Um, It would have been nice if it had been allowed to work its way through the Texas courts first, as most as most of these cases tend to do. Um, It's a very interesting law. It's a very clever law. Um, I'm not sure at the end of the day that it passes constitutional muster, but I'm not a constitutional attorney. But I will say this. When Justice Blackmun wrote the Roe decision back in the early 70s, Um, We had different ideas about what fetal viability meant. Uh, And now that we're 40 plus years forward and medical science has evolved and we're saving premature children who are born at a younger and younger age. And we know more about developing children inside the womb that we know that the um, ability to detect a heartbeat means that a nervous system has developed such that that an unborn child can feel pain. And we may have to, as is being done here in the case of Texas, revise our thinking about what constitutes viability. I'd like Georgia, if we can, to focus on this week's announcement from the Department of Justice. I imagine that's something that you support. Obviously, I support it. As a woman, uh, first, regardless of the fact that I'm an attorney, whether or not you are, it, this is my position about the whole thing. If you're a man and you've never menstruated and you've never gotten pregnant, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a damn thing to say about it. Unfortunately, we have male legislators who uh, who do obviously have authority to, to make decisions and pass laws about this. But I think it, and I think what's going to happen is I think women are finally going to realize that male legislators, I don't care who they are, they have no reason, no rhyme or reason other than this crazy but law to to legislate what happens to a woman when she's pregnant, whether she decides to have an abortion or not. Until you uh, get pregnant yourself, I don't think you really have standing, legal or anything else, to pass judgment on it. That's how I feel about the whole thing. So the Roe v. Wade, it should be codified. Of course it should be codified because if a woman decides that she's, uh, she finds out that she's pregnant and she wants to abort, that's her right. First of all, what do you have to do with her body? That's the first thing I don't understand. I, I would never allow anybody in this country or anybody else, anywhere else to have any control and any, any say over what I'm going to do with my body as a woman. And I think what you're going to see, I hope, is that women will rise up and say to the men, I don't care what their position or what their title is, you're not going to control my body. What part what of a male she doesn't want to take a COVID shot? Legislate? What, what part of a male anatomy do we legislate? What if she doesn't want to take a COVID shot, Georgia? What if she doesn't want to take a COVID? We're talking about abortion. I'm, we talked about COVID. Well, you're, you're, we talking talk about, about, you're talking about a woman having a right to do what she wants with her body. What if she doesn't want to take a COVID shot? If she doesn't want to take a COVID shot, that's a different analogy than pregnant. Pregnant is a private, intimate thing. COVID is transmittable. She's not going to spread pregnancy, but she can certainly spread the COVID. So, so Georgia, of course, if she, if she should take a COVID test if she is living and functioning and circulating in, in America. That's very different than that analogy. The fallacy in it is Pregnancy is personal, it's private, it's intimate, it's internal within a woman's body. But COVID, that's a whole different conversation. Doug Bondo, listening in patiently as always, what do you make of today's announcement? And I I particularly wanted to ask about Peter's point that maybe this is something that Texas should be dealing with internally before it reaches the point where the federal government step in. Well, 
this legislation is written to try to make it uh, difficult to challenge in court. I mean, normally you have to have somebody you can sue. And at the moment, there's nobody obvious to sue. State officials have nothing to do with enforcement. It's a question of people filing private lawsuits. No lawsuits have been filed. Therefore, there's no actual you know, kind of contra act of controversy for somebody to sue. It's very clever. And that's one reason I think the Supreme Court said there's nothing at the moment that's justiciable that we can you know, rule on. I think the point here is, number one, I, some of the most passionate pro-lifers I know happen to be women. But the way to handle this is it should be a, a legislative decision. That is, this is an issue that requires balance. You know, this is not something where it's only one way or another. It's a tough issue balancing life and liberty. And that the point is a federal law doing that is far better than having it to the courts. The reality is that 1973 Roe decision transformed this issue from one that was slowly moving across the country with liberalization of abortion to basically ju judicial usurpation of the issue. And the criticism of this ruling was very strong and from liberals and progressives as well. My con law professor back in 1977, who ended up Dean of Stanford Law School, you know, told us he liked the ruling in substance, but he could not justify it as a matter of the constitution. And one of the most powerful critiques of, of Roe ever written called The w Wages of Crying Wolf by John Hart Ely. He said what was left out of Roe was essentially no discussion of the other person affected, that is the baby. That this is, you, you can't ignore this. You can't throw that out and act as if there's no baby involved. And his complaint was the problem with Roe was not that it wasn't constitutional law, it didn't even purport to be constitutional law. You read the first paragraph of that opinion by Blackman, it's psychobabble. You know, we realize this is a difficult issue, yada, yada, without discussing the constitutionality. And the problem is that turned it into this political movement where all of the battles are focused on the legal and the constitutional, as opposed to a normal political battle across the you know, states where you have to make arguments and you have to balance. And how do you balance the life? How do you balance the liberty and you try to work that out? If Roe went away tomorrow, more than half the states would keep you know, liberal abortion laws. That was a New York Times analysis. You know, so we're not going back to prohibition, but as long as you have the court step in and prevent political action, you're going to get these kinds of legislation in an attempt to keep the courts out. It's not a good way to make laws in my view, but that's what happens when people take over the courts and use them to grab control of an issue and not allow others to essentially have their say. Let's move on to our final topic, uh, no doubt the most somber one, because this weekend we mark the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. I don't think any of us need a reminder of that terrible day. So, Georgia Gosley, let's just get straight into it. What have we learned from these last 20 years? And what should we have learned? What we should have learned is that America needs to stop butting into other people's business and other people's countries going in trying to tell everybody that we're so superior and that we're going to tell you what to do. We got our butts kicked out of Afghanistan, didn't we? Going over there telling those brown people what to do and how to do. I think the lesson to be learned is we need to stay right here in America and clean up the mess we have. Do you think we have learned anything? Has anything positive come? From oh, I think we should have learned something, but we should have learned something from Vietnam. We should have learned about the Afghanis running the British out or running the Russians out, but no, we're going to go in anyway. And now we've been run out after 20 years. Peter Ruff, what should we have learned? What have we learned? Well, I thought until last week that we had learned a few things and then, and then, Clueless Joe cut and run in the middle of the night um, and left chaos behind, that which is, is so also unfair. what happened in Saigon in 1975 when the Democrats, including Joe Biden in Congress, cut off aid to the South Vietnamese Army, uh, which was part of the, the peace accord that we would continue to provide them aid, just not troops. I thought we'd learn, and we learned this lesson from Ronald Reagan that we needed to be a strong country, economically, um, morally, socially, militarily, uh, and that we needed to be ready to fight. And that was the best way to guarantee we could keep the peace. And largely that maintained until we had 
the new phenomenon of global international terrorism arise, which struck home shockingly to all of us on September 11th. But I think that President Bush mobilized the nation. He did it well. He mastered the difficulties of fighting such a war. And I think that we assembled what used to be called the coalition of the willing um, to fight these, these new terror networks. I think that we have updated our defense posture, updated our strategic objectives, the way we train our forces. And so we've learned a lot about what it's like to fight that kind of war and that the fact that it needs constant vigilance. I don't think we've learned enough. And again, I think um, what happened last week in Afghanistan is proof of that. Um, we've turned the country back over to the Taliban, uh, basically based on their word that they're not gonna let other groups set up terrorist training camps again. Um, they may, they may not. If they do, I'm sure that there's some country in the world that would be willing to take care of it, if not the United States, maybe Doug, the Germans. Doug, what have we learned? What should we have learned from these last 20 years? Well, I agree with Georgia. We've had 20 years of war that have been a disaster. I mean, Afghanistan was bad enough. We succeeded in what we needed to do, which was punish the Taliban and wreck Al Qaeda. And then we spent 20 years trying to create a democratic centralized government in Central Asia, which was a crazy thing to do. The president was right to bring us out. He did it badly. Unfortunately, there's a lot of suffering because of that, but he was absolutely right to bring us out of there. Iraq was an utter catastrophe for which nobody has paid any penalty. There's been no accountability for those who got us into a war, killed thousands of Americans, tens of thousands of wounded, you know, allies and Americans, hundreds of thousands of dead Iraqis as a result of the sectarian war, religious community, minorities devastated, ruined, kidnapped, the uh, you know, creation of Al Qaeda in Iraq that turned into ISIS, that spread throughout the region. All of this is a result of a war that never should have been fought. Yet we keep doing it. We blow up I I I Libya. And then lo and behold, weapons proliferate. 10 years later, there's a civil war going on. We back the Saudis, one of the most monstrous regimes around. They commit murder and mayhem in Yemen. I mean, the US has created utter instability and mass destruction and death. This is really horrid. I think the lesson should be, we don't get involved unless it's absolutely necessary and it's narrow. No more nation building, no cleaning the swamps. You know, the point is if somebody attacks us, we respond, try to get ahead of it if we can. But the point is the more we do of this, the more enemies we create and the more terrorists we create. You know, if you wander around blowing up countries, getting involved in their conflicts, killing people, droning them, they want to strike back. It's a tragedy. We need to keep that in mind. If we're creating terrorists as well as killing them, we're not achieving anything. So my hope is it will learn to be much more restrained in this, that you want to use special forces, you need intelligence, you need cooperation, <clears throat> but the idea of going in in full-scale wars, you know, that should be out the window as a strategy. I think you've all naturally focused on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, no doubt the most consequential impact of the 9-11 attack, but I'm wondering if there's any other aspects that you think America can focus on. I'm thinking about things like the unity felt in America in the days and weeks after the attack. I'm thinking about, certainly for myself as an outsider at the time, uh, remembering the expressions of sympathy from around the world for people in America. Where has that gone and how do we get that back? Well, I don't know how we get it back, but in terms of what one of the things that America can do is to face itself in the mirror and to teach the true history of America, including the events, the tragedies of slave trade in America. One of the things America could do is to pay reparations for the African-American slaves that built America and propelled it to an economic powerhouse. You know who built America? You wanna know who built America? Black women's bodies built America because they're the ones who produced the slaves, who picked the cotton, who propelled America to greatness. So what America needs to do is to clean up its own mess before it starts traveling around the world, having the audacity to tell other countries what they should do. Peter, George's saying that this should maybe be a moment for introspective thought. 
Well, I think we should always be in perspective about what America is, what America stands for. Um, we are still, as Reagan said, that shining city on the hill, the beacon of hope and opportunity to the oppressed around the world. Uh, most people would rather live in America than the countries that they're in. And most people who live in America would rather live here than someone else. That says something. People vote with their feet, no matter what they say. People vote with their feet. But one of the other things that that I reflect on in 9-11, and, and it, it is, it's somewhat, somewhat of a sour note, is that we handed the police structure in America tremendous power after 9-11 to prevent another 9-11-like attack, and those powers were abused. They were abused by Democratic and Republican yeah. administrations alike. Um, I think it is a reminder that none of us can go to sleep when it comes to our own safeguarding our own liberty. We need to be on watch. We need to, to fight against things like secret evidence and secret wiretaps. Um, you know, the whole kerfuffle that arose early in the Trump administration regarding the bogus steel dossier and the allegations that, that Trump was acting on the orders of Russian paymasters. That, that thing, that whole thing was pushed along in part based upon laws that we passed after 9-11 to make it easier for the FBI to go after terrorists. I think we need to be careful in the future um, that we don't surrender our freedom in the name of securing our protection and safety. Doug, that, that is another point that I wanted to bring up, this security state that's emerged. I mean, you think about the US Department of Homeland Security seems so ubiquitous, only founded in 2002 in the wake of these attacks. Is that a positive or a negative? Well, certainly having someone to look out after internal security is a positive, but the question of how it's been done, the Patriot Act, for example, went too far. <laughs> there are a lot of areas where you may want to give some authority, but there has to be accountability. There have to be restrictions. Somebody has to look over the shoulder. You know, we've unfortunately treated the president as essentially an elected dictator. I mean, George W. Bush, you know, claimed that he had the right to, you know, take an American citizen in America, announce they were an enemy combatant, put them in the brig and deny them an attorney. You know, we can't have that sort of thing. So I think what we've, and I think Georgia, you know, hit on a point here, the idea of introspection. We had unity in America without any understanding of why what happened happened. And Americans weren't to blame for it, but American policy had a real impact. You know, when you went around the world supporting dictators, as we did, I mean, some of the Al-Qaeda people came out of jails in Egypt, and we funded the Egyptian dictatorship. I mean, people know that. You know, that we didn't have much introspection. We got a lot of support overseas including in the Muslim world, who didn't believe what was done was just. But then they saw us move from Afghanistan to Iraq and droning and a lot of other things. We lost that sympathy. So I think that introspection is very important. And that's the same thing with the issue of our freedoms. We want to fight against you know, uh, terrorism, but we don't want to give up what makes America worth defending. So that introspection is absolutely critical to have along the way. Power needs to be bounded. There has to be accountability. You know, Reagan talked about the Soviets, trust but verify. I would apply that to our presidents and our congressmen and our law enforcement as well. All right. So thank you for your thoughts on that. It's time now to take some questions from our viewers slash listeners. And our first one comes from Maureen Gardner, who says, unvaccinated people are putting themselves at risk, not others. So why are we mandating that they protect themselves? Who wants to take that? Well, they're not only putting themselves at risk, they're putting others at risk. If they're vulnerable, the more vulnerable they are, the more vulnerable the people around them. I mean, I don't, it's like, I don't understand. It's almost common sense with the number of deaths we've seen in this country and around the world, why people just won't get vaccinated. It's exasperating. You know, if I could add, if some people, can't be vaccinated and some can't, compromised immune systems, et cetera. 
they are made more vulnerable. And the second thing is the, the more people who are not vaccinated, the greater the likelihood of more varieties, you know, like the Delta variant. So these are impacts on other people beyond themselves. There's also a presumption that, that is at least not clear to me that vaccinated people can't carry or transmit the virus. Um, the CDC seems to go back and forth on this as they went back and forth on the issue of asymptomatic COVID, which we now know, I think, to have been, um, been a myth. Um, but again, we really can't be sure because there are lots of studies that say different things. And so if the issue here is that um, you can transmit the illness to other people, if you can in fact be vaccinated and transmit the, issue, the, the illness or have already had it, but still be a transmitter, uh, that's a rethink of, of public policy here with profound implications. Uh, and so everybody is pretending that the vaccine is the maximum total fix. May not be. Uh, let's take our second question, which comes from Delbert Hill. Now, I think we have touched on this uh, individually, but uh, let's put ourselves in George W. Bush's shoes, because Delbert asks, if you were president during the period after 9-11, would you have ordered the invasion of Afghanistan? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I would have advocated you know, the uh, kind of two month campaign that took out both Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Taliban was essentially defeated by October. Indeed, they were willing to negotiate an effective surrender and the Bush administration turned them down. My view is you had to wreck Al Qaeda, you had to punish the Taliban for hosting Al Qaeda, but it did not make sense to want to stick around and try to create some westernized government there, especially when you had effectively won and the Taliban was willing to step back and you could basically allow your allies to move forward and leave that and uh, you'll come home. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, uh, you know, so many, I lived abroad. I lived out of this country for a while and so many Americans travel and take a couple of weeks, a couple of months. But when you live outside of this country, and I often heard, oh, you're so American, you're so American. I never knew and understood what that meant. Mm -hmm. But uh, America's a great country and I love my country. But the more I travel and the more uh, communities abroad that I see, the peacefulness, the inclusiveness, you know, America's slipping in my, in my judgment. So, you know, when you live abroad, you get a different perspective then because we live in America and we're brainwashed too. We get propaganda too. So we're laboring under assumption of this and that. You travel around the world and your perspective changes and expands. It certainly does, George. It wasn't until I moved here that I realized you could take a raincoat off, but that's a different story altogether. <laughs> uh, Peter, um, what did you make of Delbert Hill's question? If you were George W. Bush, would you have ordered the invasion? Yeah, so I think I probably would have. Uh, I probably would have tried to do it um, under international auspices like the first President Bush did to liberate Kuwait. I think that Doug's correct that the in and out strategy was the right strategy. Um, I think that domestic political concerns probably took that off the table. You know, on the one hand, there were people who talked realistically, Secretary Rumsfeld, for example, about the cost and the commitment that would be involved in going in first to Afghanistan and going into Iraq and how it could go on and be very expensive and that caused him to be pushed aside. Um, on the other hand, you had the people like Colin Powell saying we can't go in until we know what our exit strategy is, which was simply delaying action in both cases. Okay, well, thank you for that, folks. And uh, now is the part of the show where we usually go to our most underreported story of the week. But with this week's anniversary, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we thought we'd take a time, one more time, to reflect on that and ask that question that anyone over a certain age on this day no doubt knows the answer to. Where were you on 9-11? Georgia? I was on my way to uh, Annapolis, Maryland, to the Maryland um, legislature to, do, to lobby on behalf of a trade association. And 
I had just gotten in my car to drive down and I heard that a plane had hit a skyscraper in New York. I'll never forget it. And yeah, you know, I was on my way to lobby and all of a sudden the world changed and it's never really been the same, but I remember that. Doug? Well, I was home, which is unusual. I travel a lot and thankfully I had not been on an airplane where I would have been stuck overseas somewhere. But I was home and I, I don't own a TV. I haven't owned a TV for uh, you know, like 40 years. So I'm uh, somewhat disconnected from that immediacy of news. And I had gotten on my exercise bike and I finished up and went to my computer and refreshed the news and saw these stories. So I called up one of my friends at Cato and basically said, what on you know, God's green earth is going on in this world? And he explained to me what was going on. And I got a, a phone call from the person I was supposed to have lunch with in Washington. It's actually with the, the Taiwanese uh, delegation. And he said, maybe today's not a good day to have lunch. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. And found that, you know, my day and the issues I was writing about changed dramatically that day and for, you know, for the year to come. Peter, where were you on 9-11? Well, when I first heard that a plane had hit the World Trade Center, I was on the highway right next to the Pentagon on my way to work in Washington. Wow. I was working for United Press International at the time, and I called... I called into the news desk to tip them to a story from the, from, the, from the middle of the Second World War in which a bomber in a fog had flown into the Empire State Building if they were looking for color and perhaps some photos that we had on file, not realizing what had happened. Uh, by the time I got to work, uh, which was right around the corner from the White House, strangely enough, inside what eventually became the security perimeter. The second plane had hit the second tower and we knew what was going on. And so I spent the day at my desk at the newsroom, um, walking around Washington, D.C. to check out various reports of the day that the mall was on fire, that the Capitol had been hit with a plane, that there were car bombs going off at the State Department. Then I worked my way back to the office. I happened to bump into Senator David Boren, now then retired, uh, the former chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I got a quick interview with him that I put on the wire. And then I got a phone call letting me know that a friend of mine, Barbara Olson, the wife of the then Solicitor General of the United States, Ted Olson, had been on the plane that hit the Pentagon. And so I spent a couple of hours um, writing a piece about Barbara and how much Barbara loved America and how much I would miss her as a friend and how glad I was to have known her. Um, didn't get home that night. There was no way. Uh, no one could come in and get me and the metro was closed. So I spent the night in a DC hotel and went back to work the next morning. Life in the wire services. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, Peter certainly sounds like you were closer than than most. Uh, this is one of those questions that I guess I get to answer myself. Um, very different story, of course. I was uh, in high school in Scotland. So <laughs> felt a long, long way, felt a long, long way away from me. And of course, with the time difference, it was the end of our school day when the attacks were unfolding. And I remember hearing that there'd been an attack on the Pentagon. And, uh, and as someone who's keenly involved in history, thought, this is it we're going to war even then as even then knowing from the uk and that as, as they call it the special relationship with america i thought this is it this is this is the, going to be the beginning of a war um and uh, yeah we've we've obviously talked about the consequences of that but i didn't see the images myself until i got home and my mum will tell you that her abiding memory of that day is myself my brother and my sister in our three school uniforms standing in front of the television in our living room, just watching in horror at what was unfolding. So, yeah, certainly we'll never forget it. And uh, as someone who volunteers in his local fire department, I, I think I'll take a little point of personal privilege as well, just to mark uh, the memory, especially of the 343 New York firefighters who were killed on that day. And uh, just remember their sacrifice and their, uh, their commitment to service. So a very different end to the square circle for us this evening but that is all we have time for thank you to our guests
And thank you to listening for listening or watching, if you have been, to The Square Circle. I'm Adam Bierne. We'll see you next week. <laughs>